special welcome to the Washington University class. Do I know some of you already? I know I certainly know Heather, Dr. Rice. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. I applaud you all for getting up so early on a Sunday morning. It's a long drive. So I'm going to talk this morning about a number of things, but sort of focusing on meditation as it relates to uh, the bodhisattva path in Mahayana Buddhism. Um, these special practices which we call paramitas that um, are, are practices of the bodhisattva path. And, and why it's important to meditate, why it can be of such benefit to all of us. So, um, I'm going to just start by talking a little bit about myself and how I came to be here wearing these robes, sitting on this seat. I haven't always been a Buddhist. I was raised a Catholic and was quite devout um, until I was about 18 or so. And then I found out that I, I didn't really have the kind of faith that was considered essential to the practice um, of my religious tradition. There were too many teachings that, that really I couldn't make sense of. I couldn't, just couldn't get my head and heart around. But that were considered essential doctrines to accept and believe in in order to be a good Catholic. On the other hand, the first time I ever heard of meditation, I knew I wanted to learn it. I heard about transcendental meditation when I was 16 or 17, and by the time I was 20, I finally had an opportunity to, to learn it. So that's when I started meditating. But it wasn't until I began practicing on the Buddhist path and studying the Buddha's teachings about meditation and other matters that the practice really opened up for me and became a much more central part of my life. It was important to me that I could be a Buddhist without having to follow certain beliefs faithfully, uncritically, even if they didn't make sense. And in fact, the Buddha encouraged his followers to question authority and test all teachings and practices for themselves. This is why Buddhism is sometimes referred to as a practice-based religion, if it is a religion, in contrast to those like Christianity that are more faith-based. And that's not to denigrate or put down any religion, Catholic or any Christian faith or any other religion. Uh, in fact, I think that maybe that kind of faith is a, is a gift. But this morning I'd like to talk, as I said, about one of the six paramitas in particular, these practices on the bodhisattva path. Um, it's the fifth one, which is concentration, or often called dhyana, which is what the the word chan and zen comes from, jhana, samadhi, or simply meditation. So the six paramitas are in order, generosity, virtue, or um, ethical behavior, patience, energy, or diligence, concentration, and wisdom, or insight. The paramitas, as I mentioned, are practices essential to following this bodhisattva path, which is the commitment to helping all beings to achieve or realize enlightenment, awakening, liberation from suffering, before we relax into our own um, final enlightenment, liberation. So we put off, as it were, our personal liberation 
from this samsaric or illusory existence until all other beings have achieved theirs. This vow, as you might imagine, is not limited, can't be limited to one single lifetime, but to as many as it takes to achieve the liberation of all beings. So I love this bodhisattva path because reminding myself of the vows, I feel liberated from the pettiness of much of life. The vows are impossibilities if we look at them from a conventional or rational standpoint. So in order to take these vows, it's like you have to be a little bit crazy. <laughs> which means you're not rooted in the world of conventionality or normality. You have to have at least one little toe in the supra-mundane world. You acknowledge implicitly that this is no task for one short lifetime. You realize it will take numberless lifetimes. And so you become a citizen of the universe, of the eons. As a Zen teacher Pat Phelan says, if you have a well-defined task with a beginning, middle, and end, you can estimate or measure the effort needed. But the bodhisattva vows are immeasurable. The intention we arouse, the effort we cultivate when we call forth these vows, extends us beyond the limits of our personal identities. The way I understand it is that my vow, if it's strong enough, will live on in various forms. Not that I will in my personal relative identity. So as long as there are suffering sentient beings, there will be someone around to help them out of their suffering. This is what I'm investing my energy in. This is what my vow is helping to ensure. Here are the vows that a bodhisattva takes. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Desires or delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. Parenthetically, Dharma gates refers to the knowledge of all modes or all the methods of practice that lead to awakening, which are as numerous as there are individuals. It also means the Buddha's teachings, uh, Buddha's doctrine in which there are, it is said, 84,000 paths, and each one can be a gateway to uh, realization or enlightenment. And the fourth vow is Buddha's way is unsurpassable, I vow to attain it, or I vow to become it. So why is meditation or concentration important for carrying out the bodhisattva vows? How does meditation help us to save numberless beings, to put an end to inexhaustible delusions, to enter boundless dharma gates, and to attain the Buddha's way? Well, first of all, meditation leads us to wisdom and enlightenment, and attaining the wisdom of an enlightened being would certainly put us in a better position to fulfill the vows. Meditation leads to wisdom by purifying the mind. This means it frees us from ignorance and attachment even attachment to attainment. Mm -hmm. This makes us better able to practice the other paramitas more effectively. We can help other beings more skillfully. Here at Mava, we practice Chan Buddhism, which is the Chinese name for Zen, a term that's often more familiar to people. Chan Buddhism traveled from China to Japan, and the name for the practice of this dhyana, or Chan, single-pointed concentration, came to be called Zen in its new home. Jhana is a practice, 
that's not easy for lay people to achieve. Our lives as busy Westerners are so different from the monastic life that allows hours of practice and relative freedom from distractions in order to develop a high level of concentration. I believe teachers of jhana recommend a daily practice of sitting meditation, minimum one hour, to be able to, to put this jhana practice into, into effect. So what can we achieve as lay practitioners? How can we further our bodhisattva vows? I'd like to make the case that we can better practice the other five paramitas and therefore more skillfully follow the bodhisattva path if we meditate even at a level less than the deepest single-pointed concentration of this practice called jhana. The least we can do to begin with is to commit ourselves to a daily meditation practice. So we can take this as our starting point. I vow to meditate daily. For some of us, this seems almost as impossible as the vow to liberate all sentient beings. But this can be my resolve, even while I accept that I may not always achieve it. And I believe that by adopting this consistent practice each and every day, we can develop the other paramitas at the same time. Let's start with generosity, the first paramita. How can a daily meditation practice make us more generous? I earn merit or benefit for my life when I meditate. So this is a gift to myself. I'm also joining with other Dharma brothers and sisters who are also practicing, and so I'm augmenting their practice with mine. This is a gift to them. The benefit <coughs> generated by our common meditation flows outward to the world of beings, so it's also a gift to them. Sometimes practicing generosity is very difficult. We feel we don't have anything to give. I really can't meditate this morning. I really have to get some more sleep. Or I can't meditate this evening. And my friends are expecting me. If we can overcome these excuses and put in the time to meditate despite the perceived obstacles, the gift to myself and other beings means so much more. Additionally, Meditation helps to break down our ego and our attachments. This makes it more easy for us to give, materially, emotionally, or spiritually, when we're confronted by someone else's need. Then there's the paramita of patience. How can our meditation practice help develop this paramita? Whenever we go to meditate, the hindrances, which the Buddha recognized and taught us about, the hindrances come to threaten our practice. These are, there are five of them, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, or sleepiness, restlessness and worry, and doubt. When one of these phenomena arise in my mind, for instance, sleepiness, I often get frustrated and angry at myself. Another hindrance, ill will. I hate the fact that my practice is not more accomplished, that I'm having this difficulty of sleepiness. What's the antidote to such anger? Patience. So when I meditate, I'm challenged to recognize that each sitting will be different than the one that went before and the one that comes after. I'm challenged to accept whatever comes my way in terms of physical or mental experiences. I'm challenged to be patient with myself. 
and with my external distracts, any dist external distractions like dogs barking or neighbors making noise. To be patient and let them pass through my awareness without hooking me. In this way, meditation can help me develop the paramita of patience. The paramita of virtue is also developed through a consistent meditation practice. If we observe ourselves, our lives, we know that if we are to develop our consciousness and purify our minds through meditation, this requires a virtuous life. We practice the five precepts not taking life, not stealing, not engaging in false or harmful speech, not engaging in sexual misconduct, and avoiding intoxicants. Because the precepts support our meditation. Conversely, when we break the precepts, we are unable to achieve a peaceful mind. We're plagued by the hindrances of desire, ill will, restlessness and remorse, <coughs> and doubt. The best way to conquer these hindrances is by keeping the precepts and practicing patience. Diligence or energy is developed as we make our meditation practice a centerpiece of our day. Whatever time or times we set aside for it, we acknowledge that it is perhaps the most important thing we do each day. So we make sure we have a place and a time for it. This place and time become almost sacred. The rest of our daily activities flow out from it. And when emergencies or conflicts arise, preventing us from keeping our appointment at our sacred time and place, we make a sincere effort to substitute another time to make up for the disruption. <coughs> this attitude toward our meditation practice arouses diligence and energy in us for our spiritual practice, for our bodhisattva vows, for doing all that we need to do to support this practice and stay on the path to liberation. The sixth paramita is wisdom, and of course wisdom depends entirely on our meditation practice and on the other paramitas. Through the concentration and mindfulness of meditation, we come to experience the true attributes of all phenomena, that they have built-in unsatisfactoriness that they are impermanent, and that they lack an intrinsic selfhood because all things are interdependent. In this way, we become better able to let go of our attachments, our prejudices, and our consciousness is purified. <coughs> Meditation consists of two complementary <coughs> forces or qualities of the mind, mindfulness and concentration. So I think it's important to give a little bit of attention to the difference between these two practice forces or attributes and how they work together. If you'd like to find out more about this, a very good book is by someone with a rather complicated name, Venerable Hanepala Gunaratana, who wrote the book Mindfulness in Plain English and Beyond Mindfulness in Plain English. So beginning with concentration, over the ages, Buddhism has invested many resources in creating temples and monasteries that will serve as perfect places to practice concentrated meditation. Places where the conditions are conducive, without distractions, because they're secluded, no interruptions, the practitioners have no possessions, no squabbling over material things. 
And because really deep concentration can make the practitioner forget about trivialities like one's body, even the need for food and um, the controlled environment of the monastery means that everyone's physical needs will be cared for while they practice. But there's still a rich practice available to those of us who cannot lead the monastic life. And I'll describe that in a minute. Concentration can be compared to a powerful lens that concentrates light. Unfocused sunlight falling on a piece of paper won't have much effect except to make it slightly warmer. But focused through a lens, the paper can catch fire in no time. Concentration is the lens through which we can see deeply into our mind. However, our concentration has to be wholesome. It's possible for us to practice unwholesome concentration, for example, on some strong desire or on an object of our hatred, ill will. True concentration is free from these unwholesome contaminants and is the only kind of concentration that can help us. Concentration should be considered as a tool that can be used for good or ill. It cannot by itself give us self-knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. It cannot help us to see the sources of our suffering. We need mindfulness to do that. And fortunately, we do not need to live in a monastery or even be in a meditation hall to cultivate mindfulness. And whereas concentration is a, a forceful activity, mindfulness is much more delicate and can't be cultivated by struggle or force. It does require effort but, and energy, but the effort is, is gentle. We just remind ourselves over and over to bring our awareness back to whatever it is we're doing. In meditation, we remind ourselves over and over to focus on our breath, on each and every sensation associated with breathing, the focusing is concentration. The reminder and awareness is mindfulness. Mindfulness informs us when we get distracted and reminds us to come back. Venerable Hanekala Gunaratana says that mindfulness is egoless alertness. This means that it's honest. There is no me, mind, or I in mindfulness. It's unselfish and allows us to see ourselves just as we are. How we get into trouble with our emotions and actions. How we hurt ourselves and others. Because it's egoless, it's not invested in the lies and self-protection that make up our ego's agenda. In this way, mindfulness leads to wisdom. But nor is mindfulness trying to achieve anything. It just observes. It's detached from likes and dislikes. How liberating. Also, because mindfulness is not interested in changing or in achieving anything, it is the essence of patience. It allows us to accept ourselves as we are, to drop our self-criticisms, our self-loathing. Also to accept the changing landscape of our mind and emotions, our excitedness, to boredom, to anger, to peacefulness. If we can sit and accept whatever mindfulness reveals, this increases our patience. But interestingly, we also need patience to develop mindfulness. What are we when we are not being mindful? We are operating out of habit, out of what we can call karmic conditioning. 
We're distracted, caught up in our attractions and aversions, our likes and dislikes. We're impulsive, busy constantly reacting to each event, each phenomenon that comes our way by either shrinking away from it or grabbing onto it, trying to keep the good stuff here and make the bad stuff go away. The things we're neutral toward, we become bored by. We let our buttons be pushed. We make our usual emotional reactions to the people we're closest to. And we may find that we treat them <coughs> thoughtlessly, inconsiderately. These are words that describe ways we act <coughs> when we're not being mindful. When we are mindful, we're truly present to other people and they are truly present to us. We treat them the way we wish to be treated. We treat them thoughtfully, considerately, kindly, compassionately. Once we get a taste of what it means to be mindful, we realize its value. <coughs> this is why at retreats we often cultivate noble silence either for the whole retreat or at least parts of each day, because it helps us to be more mindful. Giving free rein to our speech, our talking nature, really stirs up our ego and our habits. Keeping silence is no guarantee that you'll be more mindful. You still have to, uh, you can be silent and just get involved in constant daydreaming, but it sets up the conditions for greater mindfulness. We still have to apply the effort. Quoting Venerable Gunaratana, mindfulness grows only one way, by continuous practice of mindfulness, by simply trying to be mindful, and that means being patient. The process cannot be forced, and it cannot be rushed. It proceeds at its own pace. And while retreats and sitting meditation help us to develop the habit of mindfulness, we don't have to wait until we're sitting on a cushion like today in order to be mindful. We can practice mindfulness anywhere, at any time. Just by turning the light of that honest, non-egotistic awareness onto whatever we are doing. In this way, we grow in self-knowledge, self-confidence, and self-trust. We become less fearful of other beings because they don't have any nasty surprises to spring on us. Our ego is reduced and purified, so we don't cause fear to other beings either. In closing, I would just like to offer the aspiration that all of us may grow in our practice of meditation, and mindfulness, May we all become more committed to the bodhisattva vows so that all beings may be free from suffering and the causes of suffering, that they may never be separated from the sacred joy that is free from suffering, and that they may dwell in the great equanimity that is free from attachment, aversion, and ignorance. Thank you so much for your attention.